to get things started. Um, anybody see his show yet? Any of it? You've seen his shows before? Where? Here? Uh, mm -hmm. The last one, the, when you were here the last time? Here, there, everywhere. Oh, nice, nice. I'll see your fans. You got big fans. Yeah, right on. Well, the sisters, they feel like they have to come and support. Of course. Of course. <laughs> not have to. Want to. Want to, yeah. Yeah. So inspirational. I, I've never seen your show in person, but I'm looking forward to it this weekend. Oh, awesome. And um, again, just really grateful that you're here. And I'm sharing this thankful that you invited me. Mahalo. Um, so I guess the first question we wanted to kind of get into, um, or I wanted to ask you about this, is, is your show is called Pula in Unusual Places. So I'm curious, what's like the what's like the most unusual place for you, and and you know why was it unusual, right. and and you know after having been in that unusual space, doing you know something that as sacred as Pula, yeah, you know what was that like? Um, well, you know, living in San Francisco, we, our halal has been there for a little over 30 years, and we've had many opportunities to perform at unusual places. We're in San Francisco, which in and of itself is an unusual place, right? It doesn't feel unusual anymore because we've been there for so long. Um, so the idea came up because, well, last year we did The Natives Are Restless, and that definitely was a, a very challenging show, if not inspiring for us to create, to craft, uh, but I needed to turn that coin around and make something a little lighthearted um, to allow that side of myself and the company to um, be showcased. And this has been something that's been percolating in my mind to talk about the different places that we've performed at because some, some of them are unusual and some of them are downright strange and I welcome strange. <laughs> so um, in the show, there's several places that we talk about and one of them is I teach at San Quentin State Prison. I am a resident kumahula <coughs> slash spiritual advisor. And I've been there for about a little over three years now. And I was sort of curious as to how that would go because a lot of the guys in the prison are Hawaiian. There's a collection of Hawaiians, but many of the guys in the group, and the group is called the Native Hawaiian Religious Spiritual Group. And here's something really smart about those guys. In order to find a space to what they call worship, they needed to come up with a group, um, and so the Native American Indians have a space, the Catholics have a space, the Muslims, even the KKK. Under, they worship the god um, Odin, so under religious practice they get to have a place. So these guys came up with, not came up, but the Native Hawaiian Religious Spiritual Act, which was actually, I think in the 70s, um, they put us under the auspices of the Native Americans and the Native Alaskans so that Hawaiians had a place to worship or do whatever they needed. It's not really a religious class, it's basically hula, but they don't call it that, uh, they call it service. So I'm conducting service, and if you know me, that's kind of an irony that I relish. <laughs> and, but I was curious as to how the guys would respond, because most of them are not Hawaiian, and obviously when you try to connect to a cultural thing, you're usually from that culture, right? Uh, and so I was surprised, actually, yeah, I was very surprised, but the one thing that they immediately connected to was having a place, a community, to be with one another, and a community that was valued and acknowledged, and uh, they responded to that. And then what was really interesting, when I first came there, they were taught a haka by somebody, I can't remember who it was, Hakas are really popular in the mainland. Various sporting events and definitely in prison. Right? I'm a man, hear me roar. They like that. So, but it was the only kind of dance that they learned. So when I got there, you know, Hakka is great. It's very powerful. And uh, I'm sort of curious as to, well, what does it mean? Can you tell me what your Hakka meant? You know, it's a warrior's dance. But that was the extent of it. But that's a rather long Hakka. It has to say something else besides warrior dance. So they couldn't explain to me what it meant. I knew they wouldn't know because whoever taught them obviously didn't know that either. So I said, well, if your haka was a coin and you turned it around, what's on the other side? Who, who are you over here? What else do you have to offer? And I reminded them that your ancestors, not all of them were warriors, practically very few. They were probably fishermen, you know, um, agriculturalists, artisans, hairstylists. And um, I said, with hula, I want, I want to help you explore other sides of you. And when I teach you a chant, 
you will be able to say to anyone who asks you, what does that mean? You'll be able to tell them what it means, what it talks about. I want to empower you with that kind of information. And they really love it. Many of them are committed. The only unfortunate thing is, that, not unfortunate, it's a great thing, they get released, right? And you spend all this time and energy in teaching them, and after a few years, and the great thing is they are released, but it's rather bittersweet for me because some of them have turned out to be great dancers, and then what? Then they're gone. So my next project is I'm working on a way to get the guys who have been released to come into Hula and to spend time with my guys and the community so they can really feel what it's like to be in a halal and be in a community and get that kind of a, establish those relationships. So what surprises me the most is besides them really loving the community aspect of what they're learning is how they really enjoy the dance. It's a challenge to them. And it's over the three years I've been doing it, the art of watching them be really pleased with themselves as they develop a skill, it's been great. It's, uh, it's one of the most meaningful things I think I've ever done as a kumuhula. So we talk about that and we have a little video documentary that I made that showcases what happens um, with the guys in prison. And it's a difficult environment to teach because you never know what you're going to get when you go over there. You know, half the guys aren't there because each unit is in lockdown, which means something happens so they got to search all the cells and all these people got to leave. Or I go in another day, it's raining, poor visibility, no programs, it's canceled. They don't care. <laughs> and somehow nobody calls me to tell me that things are canceled. Um, so you have to go there with a lot of flexibility. You know, kumuhulas aren't really noted for their flexibility. <laughs> but I have been working on mine quite a bit. Uh, yeah, just going with the punches. So that's something that we do. And it's unusual. Um, but it's getting more and more usual for me. So another place that we talk about is the San Francisco Opera House. So the San Francisco Opera House is exactly that. It is made and tailored for the San Francisco Opera and the SF Ballet, which are two major art companies in San Francisco. I am the uh, co-artistic director for the San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival. And the Ethnic Dance Festival has been this amazing, wonderful festival that's been going on in San Francisco for over 40 years. San Francisco is home to over a hundred, a hundred, unique world cultures and dance right in the Bay Area. It is the most out of anywhere in the world where you have so many different cultures concentrated in that area. So there's a, a huge ethnic community. And all of them, like how we are, with our halals, perpetuating and preserving and, and, and evolving our art, art form, so are the Indians, so are the Chinese, so are the Mexicans, so are the Spanish, I mean, a lot of the Africans. Um, so this festival is a wonderful place for them to showcase what they do to the wider community. And a few years ago, they were able to get into the Opera House, which is a huge deal because nobody gets into the Opera House unless you're the Opera and the Ballet and Shen Yun. <laughs> yeah, yes. um, so we actually did and it was a big deal and when the, they first got the contract, the executive director of the festival called me and said, Listen, I know you guys um, dance a hula to an opera song, which is in our repertoire. And I said, yeah, we do. She said, well, we would love to have you perform it at the opera house. It makes sense, an opera hula at the opera house. And I was a little apprehensive because we've done the festival many times and I love it. But you are committed to many, many days. Uh, and our summer was very busy. And I was like, oh, gosh, you know, I would love to, but we have a very busy schedule. And she said, well, if you do it, I promise that I will get you two of the best opera singers in town. Because <laughs> we do it to attract, you know? I like, like real kind of opera singers, not the student intern kind, real kind. <laughs> <laughs> she said, no, real kind. So I said, okay, and we did it. And you can ask any kumuhula this. When you're accustomed to dancing, whether even a Hawaiian song, to a certain track, like let's say if you dance to the Rhodes Casamero or Jerry Santos or Makahasans or Napalapalai, you're a ma to how that track goes. And sometimes when they do it live, it's not exactly the same. Now have another artist do that song, and you're really kind of in dangerous territory because you don't know what they're gonna bring. So I was like, mm, all right, well, we'll see. We finally get there in a rehearsal. It's stunning. It is a huge difference when you have 
people who are at the top of their game singing for you. So I bought them. I bought them over here to sing that song. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. It's what song? Song. It's the flower duet from the opera Lachne. You guys know it. It's one of the most famous arias. I would do it for you, but I'm a horrible example of it. <laughs> it's the United Airlines commercial. <laughs> you want me to go on? No. Okay. <laughs> and yes, we do the opera, and we have. Um, I went to. <laughs> I don't know if you folks have heard of a festival. It's not a festival. It's an experience. It's called Burning Man. And Burning Man happens every August right before Labor Day in the desert of Nevada. It's an actual desert. It is completely empty until they have this Burning Man experience, which over 70,000 people attend. It's very difficult to get tickets. And you have to bring in everything that you need for the week because it's a desert. There are no bathrooms or gas stations or grocery stores. It's completely empty. You bring in everything. And there's, this has been going on for a very long time, and the artistry there is one of the most inventive, creative, just spectacular kind of artist, artistry that I've ever seen in terms of sculptures and, and size and what people are creating that has to last in the desert for a week. And at nighttime, it has to light up and be interactive, uh, blew me away. And the first time that I went there, I thought after like 10 minutes of walking around at two o'clock in the morning, which is the time we got there, I thought, I'm gonna move my home. We're gonna dance. And then the year after that, about 10 people, it went really well, and I said, okay, so now that we, you 10 have done it, I don't have to be the only daddy. You can take care of your little brothers and sisters. And we came the next year, and 30 dancers, 10 crew. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Makes any Nikki or Ike performance, anything look like kindergarten. It almost killed me. <laughs> the extreme environment. It's funny because my friend was a ranger there and said to me, <clears throat> she said, I just want to give you one word of advice. I said, yes, he said, just remember this. The desert is trying to kill you. That is all. <laughs> Have a good time. <laughs> and it's true. If, you're not if you don't prepare yourself, uh, it can be very, very taxing. The idea behind it is that through adversity as a community, you come together, and if you're able to work through it, the opportunities for you to create magnificent work is very possible. And uh, I have to say it, I agree. So, yeah. But, this year, I'm going back again with some of them. I said, I ain't paying for you folks this year. You can pay for your own if you like, oh, because that was a lot of money. And about half of them are going this year. But I'm not working that much. <laughs> okay, I'm tired of hearing myself talking. Well, I wanted to ask you, just based on that, sorry, I didn't want yeah, yeah, to yeah, no, no, no. read that way when you were talking. So I wanted to ask you, you, you were just sharing uh, those experiences. How? How has that, you know, developed since then? I mean, what's what's coming forward now? I mean, you, you're coming home to share, you know, you've culminated all these experiences and you're yeah. coming home now. Right. What's next? Oh, you know, for whatever reason, this year, and I hear it all the time, people are very nice. Oh, this is your best show yet. Like, oh, thank you. Why next year's last year's one was John. People always say that. It's very nice. So, this year, people were like, this is really your best show. It's your best show ever. It's your best show. So, okay, that, thank you. What the hell am I going to do next year, right? Right. I got such a good idea. So good. I cannot tell you. <laughs> I was worried about it. I was under a lot of pressure as to what we could come up with. Um, can, can you I, give us like a, a hint, like what it has to do with it? Is it does it have to do with the, the current vibe, you know? Um, I'll tell you the name uh, of the show. Okay. Ready? called Mahu. <laughs> go there. Yeah, huh? yeah. The, oh, yeah. Okay. I, I am there. Yeah. You're not right, going right, anywhere. Right, right, right. You're going to bring yeah, it. You're going to bring it. Yeah. I, you know, it's, I'm going to do a show that features just all transgender artists. And who has better transgender <laughs> artists than Hawaii? Let me think. Yeah, nobody. 
So I want to showcase them and their element doing amazing things. So I'm excited about it. I haven't told anyone that, so don't tell anybody. Don't <laughs> want it. Um, There's all sorts of secrets. <laughs> so you're going to have a military scene in there, obviously. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Okay, okay. Um, yes. Makes total sense. Yeah. So, right. I'm inspired by things that happen in where I live in San Francisco, as well as I come home. Home is an entirely different place than it was 30, 40 years ago when I was dancing hula. There's so much. The well is so much deeper here. That it amazes me. I'm constantly surprised and inspired by what the young people are doing. To the opportunities that they have. And you grew up here on Oahu. I did grow up on Oahu and I danced for uh, Robert Casimero uh, for 10 years and I left and I came back and I studied with Anthony's mom all the time and Uniki through her. I'm, you know, my Yeve is always attached to people right here constantly. You have to, right? You have to be on top of it. Um, so yeah, I'm inspired by what's happening in, the, in San Francisco as well as what's going on in Hawaii. There's so much happening. So, and we have a lot of guest artists from Hawaii in this year's show, and they're pretty spectacular, so, yeah. So, does anybody have, you know, obviously you folks know Robert. And, uh, Patrick. Patrick, sorry. Folks know Patrick, I think, around the yeah, right. You planted that little seed in there. But you know him, I mean, is there anything that you wanted to know more about his work, where he's going, where he's been, what's... Where I'm not going. <laughs> I mean, feel free. This, we don't have this kind of opportunity that often to have this kind of intimate time. It's it's very special time that we get to share with him. So I encourage you if you want to know anything or have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, you do have a book. We do have a book. The names are restless, and it was here. And I'd like to think that it's sold out. Uh -huh. No, you know, mine is not here to, to kind of divulge any more of that. Yeah. But I would yeah, think no. so. Is it, is it still in print? Are you? It's still in print, yeah. yeah. Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's why too. You know, yeah. a lot of times when, the, right. when it moves that yeah. quickly, they just... Yeah. 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 It ain't moving that quickly, but... I believe yeah. it did sell out. Oh, yeah, it did. Well, it did sell out. Thanks, I take more. Quick uh, question. Yes. How, how was it when you first went to San Francisco to sell the halal there? Uh, you know, when I... That was in 1985. And in 1985, any sort of hula Hawaiian activity done in the mainland, let's just say, was considered like, all oh, right on, you guys, keep it up, try, keep going, <laughs> you did okay. So people were just trying to keep up, not keep up with Hawaii, people who actually left Hawaii to move over were just trying to get things started. And it's difficult, you know, because everything is here. Right, so you're way over there trying to make things happen, trying to get costume, trying to get lace, trying to get information, and it's harder. But the internet has made it easy, mm -hmm. right? And now the kumbu is from the mainland or any cultural practitioners, we come back and we study. We get cultural practitioners from here and we bring them up. So it's not as difficult or challenging to maintain or even create an organization, but you're still that farther away. I mean, I come home and you're immersed in it. There's so much available. Only when I come back, I recognize, wow, we're really kind of out of the loop in so many ways. When we think we're getting a lot of stuff, but we're, we're not. So that's why I come back all the time. And I bring up a lot of people so that, you know, they can feel connected. Do you feel like um, our history is changing also? You know, I, I attended a conference recently and they, they spoke about how I think 90% of our history was written in Olo Haole. Now that the Hawaiian newspaper, I mean, even me, my genealogy has changed. My connection to Oahu has changed. You know, so. Funny you mentioned that. that I did a show about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was called Kaleo Kanaka, and it spoke about that treasure trove of information found in the Hawaiian language newspaper. Did any of us, when we were growing up and going to school, did you know about that? Did you know that there were over a hundred Hawaiian language newspapers from like the 1830s to 1948? I didn't know that. Uh, you know why? Because they didn't discover that until Noilani was doing research in the 1980s. And this wealth of information found in the Hawaiian language newspapers from a Hawaiian perspective, not from an outsider's perspective, right. which is how much of our history has been told. And with Pukia's dissertation by Pa'i Kaleo, what he says in there is just, it blows me away, this figure. Everything that we've learned about our history really comes from a canon of about seven books. Right? Uh, Bethway. 
Right. right. We all know that we all have them books. Every information that we've learned has been regurgitated from those books. And those books in and of themselves are problematic because even when they were published, they were published without the whole story. Those books which we have been basing our history on represent 2% of the information found in those sources. Sounded like a show to me. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it, things are changing. And you know, and even about our history and the annexation, the legal annexation, and how now I'm hearing a lot of the term occupation, and that sounds so like, what are you talking about? That's not really not right. And it's so fringe, you know? But when you listen to it coming from such an academic point rather than just passion, um, it's mind-boggling, you know, how we've been over the years taught about certain things that really weren't true. Even terminology, it's, uh, it blows my mind, it's so great. So how do you navigate, you know, I mean, it's gotta be a little uncomfortable at times because you're very contemporary, right? right. And then you've got this, this kawa kahiko kind right. of a framework that you right. come from, right? right. And you wanna yeah. maintain, and yeah. obviously, you're very good at bridging the gap. So how do you how do you navigate that? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you've got those that are like the purists. Right, right. right. It's always a thing. Right. Right. As I've been navigating it for a very long time, and my, of course, Robert Casimero is my initial kumukula, and uh, he was an experimenter, you know, and he was beloved by his kumu, so he knew what he was doing, and I was always confident in him, and it's something that I, uh, I took on because I loved that sort of experimentation, but always with an acknowledgement of coming from that foundational Hawaiian place. So I've been doing my work in San Francisco for a long time, and like after 10 years, a friend of mine who's a kumuhula said to me, well, it must be really nice for you doing what you're doing up there without anybody peeking over your shoulder and constantly criticizing you. And I had never, ever thought of that. And when he said that, I was like, oh my god, you're right. That's why I'm doing whatever the hell I like to do. Because nobody's telling me, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, and there is a freedom in that when you're creating. I like to think that what I did learn eventually was how to edit, right? So, um, and having good people around me saying, maybe you should think of, but in the end what I do and trust the most is my na'au. Like, your na'au tells you. When something isn't that good, your na'au tells you. Um, and then I went to study hula with Auntie May and Nikki through her, and it was like, back to the basics. It was great. I loved it. I learned a lot from her. And I think it just strengthened my traditional foundation. Then. So now I feel I have a strong anchor and I fearless. You know, I feel like whatever I want to do, well, who's going to have a show named Mom? I'll do it! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm not, I'm not scared. Yeah. Do you think you would have been able to do something like no. that? Yeah, 10 Over years, here? 10, 15 years back. Right. Not no, yet. not yet. It wasn't time. Timing, yeah, it wasn't right? time. So yes. timing right now is yes. different, right? Yes. So that's now the beauty of what you're doing. Right. You're pushing those boundaries. Right. Yeah, the timing is it's, interesting. Yes, because I was originally going to call it trans specific, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I thought. That's the editing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That edit. And I was like, why can't we embrace that term? Make it our term. It wasn't used derisively back right. then. You know, it was just used to describe. And culturally, it's it right. right. Exactly. It's okay. Yeah. It's good. So. So I'm excited. I love that you push the boundaries. I think we need to more. I mean, even in the most ancient of our, you know, well, practices, we have to because we're evolving. We and, have to. And not only that, uh. here's the thing that a lot of people don't talk about, which I don't hear, is that are we seeing that our ancestors themselves were not innovators? How are our ancestors who came up with the most sophisticated aquaculture in the world? Mm -hmm. You cannot do that by not being innovative. Right. Right. Even if you look at traditional hula, right? You're only supposed to do certain things. When you look at traditional hula, what do you see? You see dancers standing up, dancers standing down, dancers in a hello in like a scissor leg position. You see that with every implement you can imagine, right. sticks and stones, may break your bones, sorry. Yeah. You know, Papa Hehi, a treadle board. I mean, dances that speak about everything you could possibly imagine, accompanied by drums, accompanied by double chords, puppets. This is not a culture who thought of hula as something like this. They thought of hula as something like this. They lived in that certain environment. 
and created amazing things. While the environment is much larger, there's much more to choose from, much more music, much more, more bigger puppets. <laughs> so I'm just like, like them working with the environment that I have to incorporate is what I love the most. I've been in San Francisco for over 30 years and I've seen a lot of really phenomenal dancing all, across all genres. And I will say this, that Hula can compete with any of them in terms of how expressive and beautiful it is. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. You know, um, I wonder, do you struggle with, um, I know here, a lot of stuff about how Laos have struggled with um, engaging the young people, keeping the young people, and I wonder if it's because of that lack of innovation. We're kind of out of touch, maybe. I don't know. Awesome. Maybe that's why the Kumus have to go to Japan and recruit there because you know that's a thing too, right? I mean, yeah, I think a lot has to do with finances too, because, right? Right. You have to try to how do you like, sustain yeah. yourself? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know about that. I always thought that the young people really wanted to access to all that everybody seems to be. Busy. Is that on the continent? Um, you still have it or here? I mean, you know, it's, it's still a struggle to get young people. Yeah. You know, I mean, the people that I'm filling up my halal with are the children of the dancers, right? Which is very traditional, but um, we need more. If they have more right. children, I'm like, oh, yes, we're getting old. We need more <laughs> uh -huh. people in this halal, otherwise, we're, you know, I'll retire with me. Right. <laughs> but it, yeah. I think innovation is great. I think we need to, um, and it just keeps opening up the processes and keeps us um, creative. And yes, yeah. I, I think it's important. And if you choose not to, and that's great. Right. You know, um, but I don't believe that preserving and innovation are mutually exclusive pursuits. You can do both. So, like while I'm doing all this hula in unusual places, I am concurrently training in uniki class, and it is all strictly traditional. But it's funny, you know nowadays, iPads, recording, phones, people looking at their chat on the phone. Right. I'm like, give me that freaking paper for the tower, right? Mm -hmm. But even I have a hard time with Uniki when people ask me, can I record this? Can, you know, it's, this is where we are, this is how people learn. Right. And I'm, I'm going to say, no, I didn't record anything, you know, mm -hmm. I had to memorize it, I had to do all those things, but things are shifting so. Do I allow, do I accommodate for that? Can I get out of my own way by saying just because I learned it this way, we can go in it that way? It's a constant discussion I have. With but the nice thing of it is you can you make the rules. And you're, you can do whatever you like, right? Well, you know, actually, in, in <laughs> somebody else made the rules. Um, That's great, too. Right. I just follow it. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, right. that would That's yeah. convenient. Yes, right? it is. It is convenient. So you don't have to make the decision to go, I, I didn't. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm following okay. the rules. Yeah, I don't know why yeah. boys don't have to cut there. Yeah. Right. But you gotta, I mean, you girls, you gotta keep it there long. Boys don't need to cut there. But whoever made that rule, that's a good one. I like the idea of, um, I'm not good at it, but osmosis, you know, right. and, and trying to, 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 to be that because we've gotten so far away from it with our technology. I'm guilty, you know, always looking at the phone and trying to punch stuff up. But when you when you start getting it osmosis, you know, through, through that experience, like the kiki put on a nail, right. and you do get right. it the first time, you're yes. like, I can do this. You know, I don't have to have technology. And, you know, we were very yes. good at those kinds yes. of things. Well, here's something I learned in Hula really well. I was at this workshop with this institution called Landmark Education, and they teach you some really amazing things. Um, one of the things they were doing in their weekly workshop that was driving me cuckoo bananas, and I understand why they were doing it, they would have people come up to the microphone and share their stories. Now, if you're not accustomed to a microphone when you go up and speak, you don't usually speak in it. The microphone is like over here, and you're telling your story over here. And every single time somebody went up to speak, somebody yelled up loud, can't hear you, can't hear you. I mean, that happened constantly. It was just driving me crazy. And what do you develop when you're in the halal? You develop your freaking pipiao so you can hear everything. You never say, can I hear you? Right. To people who are speaking. Right. So what do you do? You develop your listening skill. You feel like this. Right. <laughs> you develop your listening skill. This is incredibly rude and interrupted when somebody is pouring their heart out to tell them, can I hear you? It's like, shut up and listen to them. <laughs> it's not my halal. It's not my halal. It's not my halal. It's not my halal. <laughs> but the awesome thing is my halal would never ever do that. You know, they develop that skill of listening. You know, so sometimes I think the old ways, they knew what they were doing. You know, pa'akawaha hanameka, kape'awa hanameka maha. 
So, so what all is kind of culminating in this performances this weekend? What do you, what do you well, when you were developing and creating, and, you know, um, putting all your energy into this? Did you have like an end game in mind? You know, what what do you hope people will take away from it? You know, I mean, it, that's do you a, prepare like that? No. no. <laughs> it's like by the what's it? And the framework and and you're guiding all of this interacting and dancing and things. I mean. But, I, I don't have an end result that I want everybody to get out of this. I mean, I hope that people enjoy what they see and right. that they live for that moment. And um, a, a dear friend of mine was talking to me about how she sees performances and our performance because we did some work with her. And she thinks of the performance as a prayer, an offering to the ancestors. Right. And for me, that is the best description of what we do and how I think of it as an offering to our ancestors to say thank you. you know, we hope to honor you. I don't I never hope to dishonor you. I hope what that you see is a, a gift, a, com a commemorative gift to what you have given us. So yeah, that's that's it. And so you folks are on a very busy schedule. It's you're here, crazy. and then you're boom, you're back. Back, we're back on Monday, and then the following week I come back to bring a class of mine on a whole cookie for a week. That's something that's kind of big on your halal. Yes, you have experiences. I mean, it, right. And you know what's amazing? Yeah. It's like I bring these people, <laughs> these people have been dancing. So like, if, you, if you're in the class that's been dancing 10 to 15 years, you finally go on the whole cookie. I make them wait a long time. <laughs> so we come on our whole cookie. Right? And, yeah. and you finally get to learn for a he after 10 years, before that, forget it. So, um, so this class will come and they'll do their huakai, and every huakai that we've had is transformative. It's <coughs> changes people's lives. So, I'm so thankful they get it. And they come here and they recognize all the different things that we do are um, important. And it, it just it gives their work and full of dimension. Even though it's <coughs> nothing to do with hula, it has nothing to do with what we're learning, they understand that it's all part of it. You know, weaving baskets, learning about this and learning about that, not directly tied to hula, but yet within the culture, and it will give their work, their understanding um, dimension. I love that they feel really taken. I get the feeling that for your people that like, are most of the transplants they go from here to... A combination is, is of, I would say like a 20, 25%, and then some people who are just living in mainland that they have a connection to Hawaii, because it's close, that people visit. Right. Um, and just people who somehow caught a show and they love what they saw, so it's a real mix. Yeah, but San Francisco is perfect for someone like me because talk about pushing envelopes, you know, I live in a city where all the dance groups are pushing envelopes. Right. So it's, you're inspired by that kind of work, you know. Yeah. Well, I get the feeling that you're there for a reason and, and maybe more specifically for those people that, a lot of times when people leave here, they, they kind of leave bitter. It's like, I gotta leave because it's expensive. I gotta leave because it's this. I cannot right. afford that, that lifestyle, what have you. Right. And you being there really affords them the opportunity to be able to look back and, and maybe with some hope, maybe with right. more love and appreciation yes. for right. the place, yeah? Exactly, I mean, I have, Every time I come back home, it's like I drive Kane Ohe and I look at this Koala Mountain. I mean, I always loved the Koala Mountains when I was living here. But now, when I go home, I'm like, really love it. Really, really love it. This is really <laughs> the most beautiful mountains it's anywhere. Different. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, it's this. I appreciate things so much more than I ever did. Yeah. That's a real gift to have you there. You know, I, I wonder about that a lot of times. Are people that move away? Because I, I lived away for a little while too, and I remember the bitter, you know, that mm -hmm. bittersweet, you know, going for more opportunities and what right. have you. So. Right. And we didn't have a foundation like you while we were there. So it's beautiful right. that you are there, and I, I hope it, it inspires them to, to stay connected and be Hawaiian. Yeah, and I, I, it, definitely, it definitely feeds them. And the other thing for us being on the mainland is that we, we have access to funding that support the arts mm -hmm. in a real substantial right. way. It's like, I couldn't be funded if my halal was over here. Whose halal is funded by the state, by yeah. the government, by the NEA, you know? It Yours really is, happen. and it's, it's, it's perfect. It's, you're, well, you're doing what you're doing. Yes, because I'm in a community that supports the arts in a very real way. And we occupy a little niche, right? Hawaiian, well, there's not a lot of hula companies, so when you're applying for grants and they're looking at how many contemporary dance companies are applying for, they say, oh, what is this? This is a Hawaiian it's group? Right? It's different. 
They love that we have a strong traditional aspect and yet we're trying to be creative as well. Um, they see how many people are involved in our community and they want to support them. Yeah. That makes me really grateful and happy that we have that. I'm happy for you too there. I just feel like, yeah, the, the outside of our, our usual borders here, they, they are a little bit more appreciative of the culture and the arts. And it's okay. I think timing-wise, yes. it's okay yes. because right. now we're looking back and going, okay, how do we fix? I just feel like Hawaii's not being supportive of uh, enough of people like you that are doing the kind of work that you're doing. And uh, I wish they were. You know, and you know, not to put it on a downer. Right, I mean, right. it is what it is. Right. right? I, I, and honestly, though, I've never really thought of that. I've never thought of us not being supportive. Um, Just because, different, better, yeah, better, better. Maybe, yeah, yeah, right. It could right, be better. Right, yeah, I guess we could all be better. Um, because I have uh, some really amazing, wonderful friends and cultural mentors that are absolutely supportive. Mm -hmm. Both of my kumu, Robert and Antony, love the work that I do with the innovative um, hula that we dance. And if you have your kumu's blessing, what else do you need? Nothing. Really, um, I don't care what anybody else has to say about it. I have my kumu's blessing, and I'm feeling like I can, you know, got my back kumu right on. Here I go, <laughs> you know, because they know that with that comes the other traditional elements that I absolutely love and take care of, like the precious family heirlooms. You know, it's important, and I pass it on to my students. And what we do that's innovative is only taught to the performance company. The performance company is 30 people. My halal is like almost 300 and something. The rest of them don't learn that. They just learn hula, you know, break run on one. Wow. Well, does anyone have any questions for Patrick with Pukane? And is those shows sold out? Oh, no. They're playing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fancy okay. is that. <laughs> We're not playing. A few. But I guess, I guess to, at this point, it's like, go home and tell at least 10 of your friends. You know, I, it's, it's, um, I, I think it's beautiful what you're doing and what you're bringing home, and I, I wish our community was in a better space. It just seems like everybody's so bit busy. Yeah, this is a very difficult busy time. Busy and just right. challenged, and they don't have space in their head for it, and it's, it's, it's frightening and it's sad for me because we're here, and we don't make time for it. Energetically, they, they just don't, they don't vibe on it. I don't know what, what's going on with people right now. Yeah. Well, you know, it's Easter weekend and Mary Monica's coming up. But I will say this one thing, and which makes me sad, is we've been performing at a Hawaii theater for over 20 years, you know, right. every three or four years. Yes. It's so expensive now. They've yes. really raised their rates on everything that I noticed in the roster for the year. There isn't really any Hawaiian groups who cannot afford what other hala are having their whole weekend. You know, even Auntie Vicky's gone. Mm -hmm. And I and now I understand why. And this is going to be our last year because we can't afford it anymore. And that, again, that that's, not, right, that's, that's, kind of support, that's the kind of right. support I'm talking about here at home. Yes. That we're not able to provide our, and that might have to be the next, you know, subject matter for your next show. I don't know. Well, it's going to be what I see when I get on that. <laughs> 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 oh, but there's truth there, you know. There is I mean, truth there. And I think we, it's time for us to be honest. Yeah. And, um, I don't know how to make space for it. I just appreciate you being able to talk about it. Right. Because it is right. a thing. Yeah, it just is a getting thing. it out there. Yeah. And now I'll try for our next number. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lovely. I was wondering, who do you, um, are you using local artists or um, Kalao members for all your artistry? You know, like all the cos um, costumes and your props that you use. I was just amazed by uh, all of that happening. Thank you. Um, it's like a combination of both. I have local artists as well as people up in the mainland. Um, and it's so great to use whomever I can. And uh, like, oh my God, we are, I have been working with Killing Me Show and a woman named Roz Contractor from Punahou on, we're developing a new musical on the epic myth of Hiyaki Kapolipa. It's been going on for several years now. And it was going on years before I came up with it. So Kili, myself, and Roz were writing the book, writing the story. Kili is doing the all the Hawaiian music and chants. Roz is doing the English music, and I'm the choreographer and director. And it's the first time I've really been in a collaborative process with other artists. And it's <laughs> and, you know you hear horror stories, but for the three of us, it's sympathetical. We it's really wonderful the kind of work we've been able to create. The guy who's the producer is from New York, and his show last year won a Tony for Best Revival of Once Upon This Island. He's a big time. 
And the other guy who's a dramaturg who's part of the team is Stephen Schwartz, who was like the Mary Covina Pukugi of Broadway. Uh, he did Wicked, the biggest running show ever on Broadway, except until Hamilton. There's a lot of big guns backing this. And Kelly and I are really, really working hard to ensure the cultural integrity in our story. And at the same time, recognizing that we want to get it out there, right? Yes. So again, balance. How do you, how much English, how much Hawaiian? If, and you have people who are really um, top rate in their field, producers and directors from New York, who feel certain things about the way the story should be told, right? And we're like, oh, no, you don't. Or how much can we sort of let go? And that, what, what many people don't realize is that our beloved Mo'ola, the Yaka, there are tons of versions of it. There's not one, there's like about 15 that we know of. So even our ancestors were telling different versions of the story. Right. Uh, and so, but yet we're still really, it means the most to us to keep that integrity of the story and of the traditions and the protocols that we Just uh, tell the story. Right. So I cannot read the whole book. I have eight. <laughs> right. I have an audio book. Book. Just so <laughs> it's audio. I keep like, saying, we have really, an audio book. It's like, it's a 10-chapter. I'm like, I cannot. It's huge. <laughs> Not the Emerson one. Don't even read that. It's the new one. Oh, it's huge. No, it's the Emerson one. It was a sign. Uh, no, like, I don't oh, can. Oh. Jump. We'll read them. Don't throw it away because no, you have to refer to it. It's but it's the whole <laughs> Mahia here with the new oh, one from okay. uh, that little bit of that one. But it's sprawling and it's long. It's I love Fuakea's description. He <laughs> says it's the original <laughs> sex, drugs, and rock and roll story. <laughs> and it is. But it's, it's that innovation, right? Well, kind yeah, of, I mean, well, and, of, but right? we're not the ones who originated that story. It was our ancestors, right? right? They, they, they told that story. And what I was trying to get at, was, <laughs> oh, no, 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 I wasn't blaming, was her question was local artists. So the people that we've been using to play and read for Hiyaka and Pele and the other characters are local artists from here, actors and singers. Yay. <laughs> the woman who plays Hiyaka. Blow your mind. So good. So she's singing in Michigan. It's awesome. Yeah. That's really, it's, to see that talent and to let us be the tellers of our story. So, yes. Yeah. 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 So, so yes, the answer is yes. We have some amazing talent. We have Kahula Nui doing some crazy Hawaiian jazz music. Um, good, good, good stuff. I'm really glad that you partnered with them too. You really help them as well to and find their yeah. you know, space in all of this and, and, and be relevant. It's such a great partnership and there uh -huh. I am in awe of their... Well, and they love you too. They're really yeah. thankful for you too yeah. as well. I have a relationship with the momager of Koda Nui and so she has nothing but beautiful things to, to tell about Patrick and what he's done for them and giving them a space because they struggled. They really struggled with... Um, being right. kind of, they're not contemporary, right. they're, you know, old school. Right. It's just that right now, we have a tendency to look back and go, oh, that's not Hawaiian, or that's right. not, and yet, we kind of, we kind of downplay our kupuna as a result of that. You know, and here, here's right? a great because example. They dance to a like that, you right. know? Well, there's a song <laughs> from the latest album, it's called E Mao. Right, you guys are you familiar with that song? E Mao, ko ka ko olelo, e ho o mao. So it means just like, may forever our language, our people live. And one of those Emao Amaloa songs. And so we're kind of dancing like a Lindy Hoppy, jazzy thing to it. And I'm like, I was conflicted because of like, wow, the words are very um, pro la hui. Mm -hmm. But yet the tune is bouncy and kind of like lighthearted, but the words don't really match what the tune is saying. So I'm a bit confused. And I, I've heard I've heard a song before, but I wasn't really ma as to who the originator was. And did they change it and make it light and bouncy when the song was maybe more kue? So I did some research, and the original was Otto Isaacs, right? And it's just like that. Not only that, you know who else sings it like that? Auntie Vicky eating your drinks. And it was on purpose, you know, yes, that, right? That was like exactly. a some, it's feeling good, I'm gonna sing this song right. to you. Right, <laughs> exactly, and I'm like, was it have the Auntie Vicky stamp? I was like, we good, we good. Yay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So our kupuna. It was smart. Right? Yeah, it was casting those spells and just yeah. doing their thing. Casting yeah. those spells yeah. and doing their thing. Mm -hmm. Reminding people as we're singing happily, you know what this is about, like, yeah, right on. No yeah. idea, vibe that yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Wow. Well, 
I feel privileged. Uh, you know, I, the privilege is mine. I know, I'm you know, honestly, I didn't know what to expect. We said, we're going to just novel this and see where brother's at with this and what shows up. And again, you guys are all here for one reason or another. I don't know, but I know it's special. And um, we're very fortunate to be able to share this space with you. Uh, I'm the fortunate one. Thank no, you so much. And I, and I have something for you. Um, oh. hmm. it's, it's, you. You already have a couple of these. And I want to tell you about this lady. I was looking at that pool all over my bed. I was kind of like before, after, before, after. And this is kind of contemporary. Okay. So this lady oh, okay, is comprised of, are you familiar with this, this greenery here? Yes, that's uh, this is Pohinahina. Pohinahina. Pohinahina is one of my first natives. I'm a, I kind of plants. That's what oh, I do. Yeah, really? I wear a dress oh. today, but I kind of plants. So Pohinahina <laughs> is is my native, my native plant, my first Kanaka Maori plant that I put in the ground. Um, you see her at the beach, and she is um, she's 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 reminiscent of like grandmother love. Uh, so, you know, when I was weaving around and thinking, I was like, oh, I just want to make a nice lay. My thing right now is how do we get uh, this kind of air back yeah. into our air, yeah. yeah? And so this is native. And then, of course, the plumeria, you know, she's special too. That she, she is she, special she, too. And so exactly. when, I, when I was done, I was like, oh, this is kind of, this is a Patrick McCool kind of thing. Because it's the Kavaka Hiko with a contemporary, and I hope you don't mind. Oh, that mine. Oh, I so love it. Nice. Oh, mahalo yeah. yeah. oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. 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 oh, yeah. And then please stay, folks. We have we have Mia Ai. Please feel free to talk story with Patrick and, and Rob. Rob is his partner who's here. I don't know, Rob, are you, are you ready? He doesn't want to talk. To, like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, but he knows how to pronounce those names. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, beautiful. Oh, thank you. Mahalo, guys. Thank you. Yes, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Like I said, it was just kind of an informal, formal thing. And you guys are all welcome too. We just have some small male eye kind of thing. Thank you, there. mahalo. <laughs> Thanks again for my ladies. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful song. Aloha, tell my little brother. Yes. 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 Yes.